Beloved, again, I welcome you to the opportunity to our worship service this morning and the opportunity to honor our Lord through being here and elevating and glorifying His name. This morning is our first Stewardship Sunday, though I did preach on stewardship a series on the theme stewardship about a year ago, so I guess technically it's really our second, but it's our first official Stewardship Sunday where we have the opportunity to make a commitment and a pledge to the Lord in our giving. Again, this church is a very generous congregation. We've seen it over and over again just in my short two years here where you give your time just thinking about what it took to make this service happen this morning. Think about the men and women that were here yesterday afternoon at 3 o'clock taking the time to set this up. Think about the men and women that were here early this morning taking the time to get all the audio stuff set up as well as in Sunday school classes this morning. People donate and dedicate their time to the Lord. They use their talents. We hear this morning in our choir, people using their gifts and their talents as well as instruments being pl played. And we also are a church that uses our treasure to honor the Lord. And we have been so blessed, especially over the past 12 to 18 months, to see a finance committee stepping forward to seeing our deacons overseeing the role of facilities and overseeing the money. What a blessing to see people behind the scenes like Shelley Edwards giving so much of her time, though she's a staff member, but working easily 11 hours a day to make things right and to honor God each and every day. Certainly, we're not a perfect church, and certainly we don't do everything perfectly, uh, but we do seek uh, through your prayers and your support to be godly stewards of what Christ has entrusted to us. And that's really the theme, the really theme really of this morning of stewardship. It's not just about the tithe and the offering, though I am going to focus on that this morning. But the real goal here is that we will develop a spirit of generosity, a spirit of obedience, that our giving truly is an act, an expression of worship. You hear me say that every week as the offering plate comes around. This is an act. It's an expression of our worship to the Lord. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning. Now, when you start talking about money, people start getting nervous. And so I know you're already having a little anxiety. You've probably already looked at your watch and you started thinking about that pledge card. Well, I'm sure you're not alone. I heard a couple of funny stories that I read again this week. I think I shared one of them with you about a year ago. Is the little boy who was sitting in the church. And after the service was over, the little boy was walking out with his father and his mother. And he stopped and he went back to the pastor. And he said, Pastor, when I grow up, I want you to know that I am going to give and I am going to give and give and give to your church. And I'm going to help your church do well. And I'm going to give you some money too. And the pastor kind of looked shocked. And he said, well, why is that? And he said, because my dad said that you're the poorest pastor that he's ever known. Ha <laughs> ha! So I hope there's not a lot of little kids back in the back this morning as I leave, but you never know. And then the two men that were shipwrecked, they were out sailing their yacht, and they were shipwrecked. And one of the guys was just coming unglued. And the other guy was just as calm as a cucumber. He was just relaxed and kicked back and drinking a little bit of the coconut milk and just enjoying life. And the other guy came up and he was just stressing and freaking out. And he was like, why are you so calm? How can you be so calm at a time like this where we're without any hope? We're stranded here on this island. And the man looked at him and he kind of grinned and he said, well, I'm not too worried. Listen, I make about $100,000 a week and I tithe to my church about $10,000 a week. And I guarantee you, my pastor is going to find me. <laughs> oh, you got to love it, don't you? 
There's, there's probably truth in that, unfortunately. <laughs> well, beloved, we are at a time where we are blessed. The economy's tough. People are hurting. We've seen it. But our church has continued to move forward because of your generosity, because of your faithfulness. You know, there are 36 parables in Holy Scripture, and of those 36 parables, 16 of them deal with finances and with giving. 500 verses or so deal with prayer. 500 verses or so deal with living out the Christian life, but over 2,000 verses deal with finances. It was important to the writers of Holy Scripture. It was important to the Lord, and it is important to Almighty God how we honor Him with our first fruits. You know, though, beloved, as I think about this, I realize that we don't give to God. We actually return to God. Think about it. We don't give to God. We are returning what is already His. He owns it all. And I think it's that mindset that is so critical for us to understand as His church. He owns it all. You know, there are three groups of people maybe sitting out here today, but there are three groups of people in the world when it comes to thinking about giving and thinking about the church. One group says, it's all mine. Everything that I make is mine. And I only go around once in life, and I need to live it up. I need to go for all the gusto that I can. I need to eat, drink, and be merry because the focus is on me and what I can do with what I earn. A very secular, a very self-centered spirit. And that's the spirit of the world, and that's the spirit that rules and reigns today throughout our world. We live in a very materialistic society, but so did the church of Corinth. I preached on that church over a year ago in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, and I'll allude to some of that this morning. The Apostle Paul was deeply concerned about the church at Corinth because they were a church of great influence. They were a church that was giving so well, and then all of a sudden Paul has to come and rebuke them because he said, why are you stopping? Why are you allowing the little church north of you in Macedonia, why are you allowing the Macedonians to outgive you? You're going to be sending this gift to the church at Jerusalem? This Gentile group is sending a gift to the Jewish Christians, which is amazing, but why are you allowing the Macedonians, a very poor impoverished, stricken area to outgive you. And so they were starting to slip into that mindset that what they have is theirs instead of God owning it all. And then also there's a second group of people, and that's where many Christians fall into, and that's basically 90% of it is mine, and 10% of it is God. Is God's. In other words, I'll give you, God, back your 10%, but I'm keeping my 90%. Again, beloved, that is not biblical thinking. That is not what Scripture teaches. But that's the trap that we easily fall into. And then finally, the right and biblical approach is it is all God's. Every perfect gift, every good and perfect thing that we receive comes from the providential hand of Almighty God. He owns it all. And if we have that spirit, if we have that mindset, then we constantly live with an attitude of gratitude. We constantly live with a spirit of thankfulness and with generosity toward others. And that is the spirit here. We look at Proverbs, for example, chapter 3, verse 9, and we read, Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. Then we also take a moment and we read over in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. This is what I preached on a year ago. And the Apostle Paul says, 
we want you to know, brothers, about the grace. Now, it's interesting, when Paul is writing this, he's writing about the tithe and about giving, but he uses the word grace. He never uses the word money. And I just think it's a genius. He's a genius in the way the Holy Spirit has inspired him to write this. Listen, we want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief. They were begging to be in the game. They were begging to be a part of a giving opportunity to serve the Lord and the community, begging us for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. And this, not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord, and then they gave to us according to their means. We urge Titus that as he had started, so he should complete among you this act of grace, this act of generosity, this act of giving, this act of grace. But as you excel in everything, in your speech, in your knowledge, and all the more in your giving, let us honor the Lord. What a wonderful, wonderful letter to a church. What did we learn this morning from this, beloved? I believe we learned a number of things. We learned that the tithe is not the church's way of raising money. Hear me on this. The tithe is not the church's way of raising money, but it's God's way of maturing Christians. Can I get an amen? Amen. (laughs) I'm going to say that one more time. The tithe is not the church's way of raising money. And that's what we think about when we think about Stewardship Sunday, because it's how much were the pledges. Is that important? Sure. But that's not the most important thing. The most important thing is the spirit of generosity. Are the Christians, are we wanting to be maturing in our Christian character? Do we want to be mature in our giving? Do we want to give for the glory of God? Are we giving to the church? And beloved, let me stress one more time that the church is not a building. The church are the people of God. I've heard, even in my short two years here, Pastor, I'm not giving until we get a church. Now, if you want my blood pressure to go through the roof, you say that. I'm not giving until we get a church. Now, beloved, I didn't come down here to serve, and you did not show up this morning just for a building. Do I want one? Absolutely. But that breaks my heart. Because every day I don't wake up and think about, am I going to a nice office? I'm thinking about what our other elders are thinking about and our other deacons are thinking about. And that's what you're thinking about. How can we minister to the people, the people of Almighty God? Amen? It's the people of Almighty God. The other is going to happen. If this is happening, I promise you the other will happen. So I think it's very important that we realize that the tithe is not the church's way of raising money, but it's God's way of maturing the family of God. He is testing us every week. Granted, there are great temptations not to give. I understand. 2 Corinthians 8, as I read this passage very quickly, uh, my old sermon, just to remind you of some of the notes there before we look into Malachi, first we give ourselves first to the Lord. We're not talking about money right now. We're talking about our heart, our mind, our being is given first to Jesus Christ and to Him alone. We kneel at His altar and we say, Lord, I surrender all, all to Thee. I surrender. I'm surrendering my heart first. And that's what Paul is teaching the Corinthian church. 
Surrender your heart. Go back to your first love. Go back and rethink things. You're out of, you have lost your priority. You're worried about programs. You're worried about popularity. You're worried about prestige. You're worrying about many things instead of the heart issue. So surrender, first of all, and give your heart to Christ. Secondly, he says, give is an act of worship. Giving is an act of worship. It's a way that we express back to God that which is already His, and we ask Him to expand and extend the gospel of Jesus Christ through our giving. And thirdly, we give according to our means. Certainly, some of, some of you are not able to give what others of you are able to give, but we give according to our means. We give in proportion to what God has blessed us with. But the key here is that we give. And then fourthly, we want to exceed and excel in our giving. We want to seek ways to expand and extend the gospel of Jesus Christ. I think about that for a moment, and I almost tear up because I stand here today as a result of when my family went through a crisis at age 15 and lost almost everything they had. It was the church that rallied to the cause. And oh, did they do it in an honoring way. They did it in a way that did not dishonor the ego of my father. They did it in a way that was honoring to my mother. They did it in a way that said, Jim, you're going off to college in a year. Here's a little money. And it came anonymously. You follow me? There was not boasting about it, but it was done with an act of generosity. A small little church like Macedonia in South Alabama. But as I look back at that little church, it wasn't just a Jim Carter. I started going back and researching, and there was a Rayburn Williams. And then there was another one, and another one, and another one. Then there was a mission program in Brazil, just like we have the privilege to support the mission program in Haiti. And I look at this little church, and I'm in awe of the generosity. Beloved, by all means, we're not a little church. We're very similar in many ways to the Corinthians. We have been blessed, and we live in an affluent culture. And may God work in and through us as we give. Finally, as we look now at our passage, and it's a very short theme this morning in Malachi. You heard Dr. Newcomb read it. We are not to rob God. The theme here is an issue of giving of the heart. Malachi is prophesying in a very difficult time. He's a, a peer, a contemporary of Nehemiah and of Ezra. Here are the people, they're back from exile, they're trying to find their way, and God is starting to kind of get things somewhat in order now. And he was addressing, Malachi was addressing a very serious issue. He was addressing the issue of sin and of abuse that was going on within the church. He was addressing the sin of abuse in the Jewish life. They were no longer honoring God with their first fruits, and especially the priest. He was deeply disappointed with the priest. The priests were no longer honoring God. And the first half of Malachi is about Malachi addressing the sin of the clergy. And beloved, I believe it's rampant today. I believe that there are many that are caught up in the health and wealth gospel. There are many ministers today who are looking at the bottom line financially instead of looking at the top line, and that is to honor Christ and all that they're called to do. And that's why we work on this in our church. That's why we have accountability as one of the three A's of a healthy church. Acceptance, affirmation, but accountability. I must be held accountable. The elders must be held accountable. And we should be held accountable to a higher standard. Amen? I'm telling you, we must not lower those standards. Now, I shudder. When I really think about what I just said, but beloved, that is what we are called to do. And that is what Malachi is concerned about because he sees it slipping. And then after he lights up, 
the clergy, he shifts to the people. And he addresses the sin of the people. He was dealing with blem a blemished or a defective sacrificial system. As you remember, as you came and brought your first fruits, as you came and brought your lambs, you were to bring an unblemished lamb to be sacrificed at the altar. This represented the, the perfection process of what was going to happen in Jesus Christ, and it represented the holiness, the unblemished spirit of Almighty God. And as you brought that lamb, you brought your very best. I grew up in a family, and I thank God for this, the older I get, that said, and I'm not here, I don't care what you necessarily wear, but I, they said, Jim, when you go to church, you put on your very best. When you go into the house of the Lord, you honor Him. It's that mindset of reverence and respect and of honor. And so Malachi is addressing this issue with the people, and he's saying, you're not bringing the very best. You're bringing defective and blemished animals. You're cheating Yahweh. You're shortchanging the very God who brought you out of Egypt, the very God who parted the Red Sea, the very God who brought you into the Promised Land, the very God that brought down the enemy. You are cheating him because you're focusing on your comfort and your convenience. They were neglecting their giving. They were not bringing the first fruits. Malachi addresses the sins priest and the people's sin. And what is he saying? Three simple things. Number one, he says that you are to bring your offering and your tithe to a specific place. It's called the storehouse. Jerry read about it earlier in, in Holy Scripture, the storehouse. What does that mean? That means the church. People ask me all the time, where should I tithe? It's called the church. <laughs> Does that mean you can't send other offerings to other places? Of course not. But where has God called you to tithe? The church. Whether we have a building or not. Whether we are in a denomination or not. This is a church. You've taken membership vows. I take those seriously. I know you do as well. It's called the church. So the first thing we read in Malachi is we're to come to the storehouse and we're to bring the first fruits. Second thing we're to bring it to, to realize is there's not only a specific place we're to bring our tithe, but there's a specific plan. It's called a divine plan, a designated plan. And that plan is to come and to test me. God says in his word, test me. You don't believe I'm going to bless you? Test me. He has blessed this church. Many of you struggle with understanding that maybe, but if you look back, you're only four years old, and in reality, you're only three years old as an ordained, set-apart church. And he has blessed you. And so God is saying, test me, and I will bless you. Now, that's hard to really trust him, isn't it? I know it is. And it's to trust him in his daily word, to trust him and to surrender all, to not compartmentalize your life. It's very difficult, but he has commanded us to do it. And then we will reap the rewards. We will reap the blessings. There's a, sp a specific plan. And then finally, there is a pattern to the giving. The pattern is very simple. If we give, he will bless us. And if we don't, and this is scary, it's right out of Scripture, he will curse us. He will not honor us or our nation. I read recently that only that less than 10% of evangelicals tithe. Another scary statistic is that only 2% of a congregation tithes their full 10%. Another scary statistic that I read is that 20% of an average church carries the other 80%. So when we did a capital campaign uh, study, 
we had three groups to come, and let me tell you, they didn't give me that course in seminary, and I'm glad they didn't, because I had to sit through three of those, and it was very interesting. So one of the guys was really motivated when he talked to our group, our session and everything, and he told me, he goes, man, you broke the, you broke the curve here, Jim. You guys are great. And I said, man, that's awesome. I'm thinking we're at 50-50 or something. He goes, no, you're at 27%. <laughs> I said, can you say that one more time? He goes, you're, you're 27% of your congregation carries the other. And I thought, well, I guess we need to sing the Hallelujah Chorus or something. I don't know. I mean, I was looking at him like dumbfounded. And so at the same time, he said, and I did appreciate that overall we are a generous church. But beloved, I do pray that we would search our hearts this morning. I do pray that we would take seriously what Holy Scripture says about the importance of giving. Who is the role model? It is not a person here. It is Jesus Christ. What did he give? He gave up everything that we might be able to give something. He gave up everything that we could give something and that we might have the joy of salvation. So, beloved, let us continue to honor him with our time and our talents, but let us make a commitment this morning to honor him with our treasure. Our ushers are going to come in just a moment, and we're going to have our offering. And as we make that offering, I ask that you would fill out your pledge card. If you don't have a pen or pencil, you can fill it out after the service and give it to our women at the Welcome Center. But we want to collect these. We want to have a quality budget for the upcoming new year, and we want to honor our Lord as a church. I thank you from the bottom of my heart for your faithfulness, your giving, and let us continue to make a difference that we might expand the gospel of Jesus Christ. I would ask you now to simply prepare your hearts as our ushers come forward for our morning offering, and let me lead us in prayer. Almighty and gracious God, we thank you again for your holy word. We thank you for the words of Malachi, and we pray that we would give according to our means, and that, God, there might be some here that want to give beyond that sacrificially. I pray that we would have the accountability that it's needed in any church to honor you, and that we would make this pledge, make this commitment, and that we would fill these cards out, pray over them, and dedicate this, and trust you, test you with our giving. In Christ's name, amen.